What questions do you have about Michael Flynn and his conversations with the Russians? Well, I, I'm somebody who believes, Allison, that we need to take uh, stern actions with uh, regard to the Russians for a lot of reasons, what they're doing in Crimea and Ukraine and Syria, and they're meddling in the U.S. election. I think we have to, uh, I think we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to uh, understand what their objectives and their motives are and know that uh, they're not going to have the best interests of the United States in mind. And so I, you know, what, what proceeds from this I think remains to be seen. I'm pleased that action was taken. They, the, uh, you know, General Finn, Flynn resigned. Uh, President Trump was right to accept that resignation. And now it's important to go about the, the business of securing the nation. Yeah. And uh, I think a lot of it has to do with not only other areas, hotspots around the world, but with the Russians as well. But as we sit here speaking this morning, is it your impression that Michael Flynn went rogue? and acted alone and decided to tell the Russians that sanctions would be eased all on his own? Or do you believe it was countenanced from someone higher up? Well, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure at this point that anybody does. Uh, I think what's clear is that uh, Michael Flynn was acting in a way that was uh, inappropriate. And uh, that's why the action uh, that was taken was taken. And I think, it, as I said before, uh, it's important now that we move forward. There are a lot of national security threats that we face around the world. Uh, the, all you have to do is pick up a paper or turn on your television set, and you see that every day. The world's an increasingly dangerous place, and we need to be uh, focused on what we can do to, to secure our country and protect Americans. On Friday night on Air Force One, President Trump told reporters that he didn't know about the reports that Michael Flynn had had conversations with the Russian ambassador about easing sanctions. How is that possible? Well, again, you'll have to ask them, Allison. I suspect this afternoon you'll hear from uh, probably from Sean Spicer at his uh, daily avail, and and those are questions I'm sure that will get raised. But I, I don't have any knowledge. I don't have any you know answers to to those questions. I understand, um, but do you believe that the White House counsel would keep that information from the U.S. president? Again, I don't have access to the inner workings or the conversations or whatever discussions occurred. That's a question that, that is better asked of the president yeah. and his team. And you'll get that opportunity this afternoon, I think. Yeah. And I suspect I there'll I, be some hard questions asked. Absolutely. And I guess I'm just wondering, what does it tell you? What are your concerns if somehow the White House or the director of national intelligence wasn't sharing this information about this, this phone call with the president? Well, obviously, I'd be very concerned if there weren't, uh, if, if information that was pertinent to America's national security interests wasn't being shared with the appropriate people at the White House. Uh, and again, that's why I think this step was an important one. Uh, they made a move, and they made a very decisive move. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get more information about the questions that you're asking. And those are the questions that have to be answered uh, by the White House. But my 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 concern is, broader concern is, uh, America's national security interests in the steps that we're taking to ensure that we're protecting Americans. And I think what hopefully comes out of this is a renewed focus on that. And again, Russia is a, a part of that. And I'm one of many members of Congress who believe that we need to take uh, strong, uh, consequential action to where the Russians are concerned to send a very clear message that we're not going to abide or tolerate this kind of behavior. So in other words, if the president did know back at the end of last month when the acting attorney general Sally Yates says she informed the White House, is it fair to say that you think he should have acted sooner in getting rid of Michael Flynn? Well, again, I'm, I'm just not privy to those conversations. I don't know the, the, the questions that you're answering or all questions or asking are all questions that have to be answered uh, by the White House. Um, you know, obviously they made a decision. I think the decision would happen very quickly yesterday. Uh, in response to information that they received and information I think that Vice President Pence had received in briefings with, uh, with General Flynn. And I think it was an appropriate action to take. I think it was the right thing for the general to resign. It was the right thing for the president to accept his resignation. And now they've got an you know, important decision to make about who replaces him and, uh, and also what we're going to do to keep uh, the country safe. Congressman Chris Collins was just on New Day, and he said, these things happen. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. He basically said, these things happen. It's a shame. I really like Michael Flynn. It's too bad he had to decide. He had to resign. But now it's time for us to move on. Do you agree that it's time to move on, or do you think that, as, as Congressman Conyers has, and Cummings have just said, we in Congress need to know 
who authorized Flynn's actions, permitted them, and continued to let him have access to our most sensitive national security information, despite knowing these risks. We need to know who else within the White House is a current and ongoing risk to our national security. Which one do you are you more aligned with? Well, obviously, I'm 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 fully believe that if there's if you have a, a member of your team that's not getting the job done, or you have questions about. Uh, actions that they're taking that you take decisive action to address that, which they did. Uh, these things happen. There's no question about that. There are going to be members of a team sometimes who uh, get out over their skis and, and have to be reined in. In this case, it meant uh, this uh, general's removal. But you know, with respect to what happens going forward, I think, again, it's important for the White House to be able to address the questions that you are asking, and they'll have that opportunity. And I think many of us are interested and obviously uh, awaiting uh, the responses to those questions. But for right now, uh, my concern is that the National Security Office uh, get staffed up again, that they find somebody to replace General Flynn, and, uh, and they get about the important work of securing the country and protecting Americans. I think that's what most Americans want to see coming out of this. They know the personnel matters get those things happen. And, and particularly in a new administration, they're still getting, uh, you know, developing that, uh, the inner workings, I think, between the, the various uh, pieces of their national security team. And in this case, they made what I think was a strong and decisive mood and a move, an appropriate move. And, and now we got to get, out, get about the important yeah. business of protecting the country. Um, very quickly, do you think that we'll hear from Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan this morning on this? Well, we'll uh, most uh, you'll hear from probably the speaker and from uh, from the leader here in the Senate later today. Uh, we always do media availability uh, early in the week, and so I suspect, uh, like is the case with the administration, there'll be an opportunity to pose questions of members of Congress and the leadership up here. And uh, but I suspect that they, like me, will be waiting to see what the White House has to say in response to some of your questions. Let's talk about the cabinet. There's been some movement. Um, Steve Mnuchin has been confirmed for. Treasury, uh, David Shulkin for Veterans Affairs. Andrew Puzder is still awaiting confirmation for labor. And as a result of some questionable things in his past, so, um, four of your Republican colleagues say that they won't be on board. What do you think is going to happen with that nomination? He's, scheduled for, a, he's scheduled for a hearing on Thursday, and he'll have an opportunity to respond to the, the many questions that have been raised. And, Obviously, with respect to his his record, his background, uh, and and some of these issues that that have popped up, uh, any confirmation process, there are questions. There isn't anybody who comes to this that doesn't have extensive experience in in some world, and in many cases that raises questions and about conflicts and other sorts of things, and that's the purpose of a confirmation hearing. So we'll find out on Thursday when he has a chance to uh, to answer those questions, and then we'll proceed from there. But do you support him? Well, I want to hear what he has to say uh, in response to some of these questions. I, like others, have questions about uh, some of these issues that have been raised, and, and I think, in fairness, we have to give him a chance to address those. But uh, I'll make you know my decision and informed on uh, how I think he responds to some of those questions later in the week. And where are you now on Judge Gorsuch, given that Judge Gorsuch, you know, said through channels and confirmed that he was disheartened and demoralized by some of the things that President Trump was saying about the judiciary. Where are you now? I think that he represented in his response to some of those questions, Allison, that he is an independent judge. Uh, I'm, most of us are very confident that he'll be somebody who judges impartially. He's a very well qualified. He's a, somebody who's in the mainstream. If you look at the decisions that he issued, the 800 opinions that he wrote as a member of the Tenth Circuit, 98 percent of those were unanimous, and that's on a divided court with seven members appointed by Democrats, five by Republicans. And when he was appealed to the Supremes on seven and eight cases, the Supreme Court upheld his his opinion. So this is somebody who has a great record and I think uh, deserves an up and down vote and I hope that Democrats here in the Senate will permit that to happen uh, just in the same way we allowed the judges that were put forward by President Clinton and President Obama in their first terms to get an, an up and down vote well, in the United States. Well, but not Merrick Garland. I mean, look, you're, I mean, you're, you're you're changing the timeline. As you know, Democrats are very angry that Merrick Garland was sort of twisting in the wind there for 10 months. Well, there's a big difference though, Allison, between uh, and vacancy that occurs in the middle of a presidential election when people have already voted and the start of a presidential term. Mm -hmm. You look at President Clinton, President Obama, their first terms in office, they had two vacancies on the court. Uh, all four of those nominees were uh, you know, appointed to the court or, or voted onto the court okay. without a filibuster in the United States Senate. And that's the precedent we want to see continued.
Senator John Thune, thank you very much for rolling with all of the breaking news right. with us. There's this a lot of it today. Morning. There sure is. Thank you very much for Thanks, being Allison. on New